Oh, I felt good because we were poor. Like my family, like I grew up fairly, fairly, you know, powdered milk, milk type poor. I think it's like just hearing your parents over and over say, you know, oh, you know, we can't afford it. <laughs> like you can hear that. You start hearing that so many times. It's like it's going to send you one way or another. Like you're either just going to resign yourself to we can't afford it and we'll never be able to afford it. Or how, how, do, how do we afford it? I think that really impacted me quite significantly as a kid. There we go. We're live with another episode of Open Action with John McLean. And my guest this time is someone that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. But I guarantee that you've probably seen one of this guy's AR receivers somewhere in your stream or reels or because they are badass. And that guy here is John Sharps with Sharps Bros Rifle. How you doing, sir? Doing good, man. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for, for taking time to to come onto the podcast. Now, uh, as I said, I mean, I, I know before I knew who you were and your company and stuff, like the first time I saw that, um, I don't remember what you call it, but it's basically the A-10 Warhog face. Uh, from yeah, the Warthog. Right? There's one we call Warthog. Okay, perfect. So that, well, maybe I didn't know the name of it. Um, the first time I saw that lower receiver, I was like, dude. That is badass. And then you came out with like the Spartan helmet and the skull and oh, freaking awesome, man. Yeah, the first one, the first one we launched, it was called Hellbreaker. It was kind of designed after a P-40 Warhawk. Um, that was our first design. That's kind of got the tiger's face on it. and Or it looks like a shark's face, but the P-40 Warhawk was a the, called the Flying Tigers. Got it. That that actually might have been the one I was talking about, but um, yeah. I mean, yeah, either way, right. all your receivers that are made that way just are freaking cool. And I've also seen some amazing Cerakote artists do some crazy things with those receivers. Yeah, you know when uh, when we started designing them years ago. I mean, this is probably Instagram was just getting started. Cerakote was like a new thing at the time. I really I knew people would. You know, the idea was to give something to people that they could create a rifle of their own that was very, very unique. But, And I knew people would paint them. You know, I, I pictured people painting the eyes and, you know, or turning the teeth red, blood red or something like that. But I had, I really had no idea how, how crazy it would get or, you know, because as Cerakote was ramping up, we had artists like uh, Blown Deadline was one of the first ones to to paint one and do like just a fantastic job on it. Um, it really has grown quite a bit from there. So for the most part, we only sell them in black for the reason that we want to enable other artists to like then further make it their own. Now, let me ask you, if someone Cerakotes that lower receiver, does that void any sort of warranty that's placed on there? Or are you like, nah, man, it is what it is. I mean, we, I... I can't even think of the last time we had a return. So it's not something, I mean, these are all made of billet 7075 aluminum. I mean, you pretty much can drive a truck over them and they're still going to function for you. So, um, you know, if there was, if something broke up on the receiver, you know, something clearly it was a machining problem or something, then yeah, we, we would, we generally are kind of a no questions asked company for returns. Yeah. I, and I absolutely love that. Like, I think that's very cool. Um, I know there's some companies that was like, if, if like, if you do anything to it, then it's the warranty's void. We're not going to deal with it kind of thing. And and hearing you say that is actually very cool. Because, I, yeah, I mean, I love the fact that when you designed it, your thought process was, look, let's give the people something cool for them to turn it into whatever they want. Like, that's that's freaking awesome from, for me to hear uh, from a manufacturer's standpoint of being like, no, I don't want to limit people. If they want to paint the Joker's face on it, then paint the Joker's face if they want to. Oh, yeah. I mean, people are doing a ton of great laser work now, too. Yeah, like – um Years ago, I guess it would have been 2012, like the first motto that we came out with was exceptional designs and exceptional craftsmanship. And it's not changed and it's not going to change. I can see the, our entire business can be based on those four words for the next 20, 30 years. There's no reason to change it. And as long as we hold to that, um, then we're good to go. And, you know, occasionally things do happen. And so that's why we're no questions asked. Like if there's, if you have a problem with it or you think like, something is not quite right just send it back to us and we'll either swap it out with a new one or figure out what happened and fix it nice but that's nice. honestly it's quite quite rare like we have a really big manufacturing team but from sales marketing customer service like that's just me 
you know, every, every morning I set aside, uh, set aside time to go through email from folks and it's, it's not a ton. Um, but hundred percent of that communication comes through me. So hundred percent of any customer service stuff is also handled by me. And uh, we sell maybe 10,000 of those receivers a year. And, you know, it's not like I can't handle the customer service because there's just not that much associated with it. Which I I can say too, because uh, Kelly, my girlfriend, has got one of the rifles that you built, and uh, I had I had a chance to to go out and shoot it a little bit, and yeah, I get it. Like that rifle shoots like a madman. Like it it just runs. Yeah. It shoots beautifully. Very soft feeling. The only thing about it I didn't like is the CMC trigger, but I'm an AR gold guy. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, you know, just me giving her crap. I really like, I, I, I have always really liked the CMC triggers. I'll tell you just a quick little side story about that company. Um, when I was first getting started, um, we designed Hellbreaker and really not a lot of people would, it was really hard for us to kind of figure out distribution. And I knew I really had to figure out distribution um, for the product to be successful. And, and that's how we ended up at Spikes initially. Um, and I designed Hellbreaker and we got spikes launched. And then I had this other receiver that was a, a non face design, um, that we, I wanted to launch and spikes just wasn't interested in it. And so I sold it to another gun company and then that gun company never like paid for them. Oof. It, and, uh, I mean, it was for when I was just getting the business started, um, it was a significant amount of capital to have out, you know, it was hundreds of receivers and this same company was buying CMC triggers. And, uh, I was just talking to the CMC owner and, um, I can't remember how it came out, but, she, but she gathered, her name is Debbie. She gathered that something was up and I finally just told her, I'm like, man, like these guys, I think they're trash, you know, like I can't get them to pay their bills. And, you know, things are tight because we really were just getting the business off the ground at the time. And CMC cut that company off from any further trigger sales. And they were about the only people that were making a really nice trigger at the time. They cut them off and they're like, we're not sending you another single trigger until you pay sharps. And those guys, they paid us and then they got their triggers again. And so I, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to those guys and pretty much any AR you look on my wall. I know there's some other great triggers out there right now, but I, I love the CMC flat three and a half pound trigger. I put it, I put that on everything. It's like my hot sauce. <laughs> put it on everything. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, and I'll say this. Like I, I actually have shot the CMC triggers. I actually have one in, in one of my, um, my AK builds that rifle dynamics out of Vegas did. We did, we did a custom build yeah. called a blue label for a, a AK match. Oh, you you have an AK trigger. And I've got an AK trigger from CMC. And actually that, that trigger is very, very nice. Um, especially for it being what it is. I mean, you know, you can't exactly say it's a drop in trigger cause AKs don't exactly have drop in triggers. Um, pretty close with theirs though. I have, yeah. I have one as well. And I understand they just came out with a kind of a 2.0 version. That I'm kind of anxious to try. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. But yeah. And it was funny yeah. too. Cause I, we, um, you know, when Kelly asked them if, if they had an AK trigger laying around, they were like, no, we're all sold out. And then like a week later, they emailed her and they're like, we literally found one while cleaning out the warehouse, like in the corner that like fell off the shelf. So it's just sitting. You know, yeah, so cool. we'll send it to you. And, and that ended up being the one we, we put in my rifle. And it is very nice. You know, I, I give crap to, to her all the time being an AR gold shooter. Um but in reality, they're they, and as you just pointed out, them as a company, um, they're they're pretty awesome. And I know that it, in reality, if I needed anything, like if, if for some reason all my triggers went down and I had nothing to make my rifles go boom, if I hit them up and said, "Hey, is there anything you guys can do?" They'd be more than willing to to help out. So they they are a very very cool company. And anyone that buys their products, it's it's not a bad way to go at all. They make fantastic products for sure. Yeah, yeah, agreed. <clears throat> So that's awesome to hear, though, that they they backed you up because it's it's kind of nice to see when when as an industry people back one another up, and it's not like a a, cut, a cutthroat scene where it's like, oh well, I'll, I'll I'll slide in there and take the money, then you know, like yeah, they're not paying it's you. It's such a massive, yeah, it's such a massive market that we are. I think of it like when you go to Shot Show, it's one of those things where it's just an unbelievable amount of commerce that is going on. You know, it's like a, this massive river of opportunity floating by and you just got to like scoop out your little cup and that can be enough to sustain a, a business. You know, it's like such a massive market. So to that end, like 
that it doesn't really make sense to be fighting too much. Like uh, maybe if you're one of the top names fighting for some other for, or for a government contract or something like that, then I totally get it. But uh, a lot of us are just mid-sized companies, you know, and there's plenty of room for everyone. You know, like I just was talking to uh, both uh, George at Battle Arms and Josh at Radiant Weapons about uh, Ambi safety selectors. You know, we might we might be buying some from those guys and like they're they're friendly about it. You know, yeah. instead of designing our own, I'm going to go to the guys that uh, whose whose safety selectors I buy, you know, mm-hmm. Very friendly relationships. Yeah, I've got, I've got the Radians in mind. I actually had one just recently start doing something wonky. I, I, you know, I, I like to use the 45 degree for all my competition rifles, you mm-hmm. know, because I like to be fast and low, high speed, low drag. And uh, yeah, yeah, I actually stripped one of them somehow. I don't I don't know how. Maybe I just get a little too rough with it, but I actually stripped it to where I could I could click it and then just a little bit more pressure. It would, it would over rotate. And slip out of the, the detent uh, channel. That's probably so. Yeah, it's probably something to do with the hardness. Um, like d- like your detent pin safety selector detent, maybe slightly harder than than the barrel that goes inside, and which would cause you know eventually like a little uh, trough or something. That, that's created. exactly what it is. I pulled it. I pulled it out yesterday, and you can see exactly its escape route like, and and the metal. Of, of where like the detent sits into the safety is just kind of bent a little bit in this one particular direction, which is where I'm assuming it, it pops out. But either way, like I'll, yeah. I'll say this, that that safety selector has been through hell. I'm not gentle with my stuff. So the fact that yeah. you know, everything is going to eventually fail, we, we know that like your car can't run forever. Your TV won't stay new forever. It's going to burn, you know, so you can't really yeah. get crap. And yeah. the fact that, I, I mean, I had that safety in that rifle for, Oh gosh, I gotta say, maybe it's going on eleven years. That's a pretty good run. Yeah. <laughs> so you got a yeah, it costs forty bucks, so forty five, fifty bucks. So you got it costs you four bucks a year to have exactly, that. Exactly right. That's not bad at all. That's not a bad return on investment. <laughs> pretty pretty so. good run. Yeah. I tried the forty five degree selection for a while. Actually, really only on one rifle. And then one day I was like, most of my stuff is, or all of my stuff now is 90, but at the time it was all 90 and I had one that was 45. And I was on the range one day and my mind just could not get around it. Like I thought, like I, I thought my safety was broken. You know, I was like, why in the fuck is this thing not going the full? And then I'm like, oh yeah, I I said it to that. (laughs) This is how it's supposed to be. And actually I switched back. I'm like, "I, I just don't. It was just, a, it only took a few seconds for me to, to square it away and understand what I did, but it was enough where I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't need that. You know, I think I'll just keep everything standard 90. Yeah. And actually, you know, I, I swapped it over back to the 90, um, for this particular rifle. Cause before it was a rifle that I was maybe shooting from competition here and there. Um, and now mm-hmm. what I, uh, because it's the shortest rifle I own that isn't an SBR, it's got like the pin and welded comp to make it legal. Um, I've turned it into my shit hits the fan rifle. Uh, so it's got a sling, it's yeah. got a weapon light, it's ready to rock and roll if, if I need to roll out kind of thing. And I was like, you know what? Uh, in a in a rough situation, maybe 45 degrees isn't what I want. Maybe I want the full 90 to ensure that when the safety's off, the safety's off. And when the safety is yeah. on, I want it to stay on kind of thing. So I did flip yeah, it to the yeah. 90. But yeah, you're right. The, the first time... Uh, I I shot a rifle that had a 90 degree safety. It was funny because I like I put the pressure on it. I felt the safety kind of rotate, and then I went to go pull the trigger. And I'm like, why doesn't it go? Oh, click <laughs> all the way around. Yeah. Push it all the way down. Finish it out. Finish the job. <clears throat> yeah, and that's and yeah, that really kind of proves like the difference between. <clears throat> I know everyone calls it muscle memory, even though your muscles can't retain memories, right? It's kind of more of a neural link pathway that we develop. But you know, it's like when when someone shoots a Glock their whole career. And then you give them like a SIG 226, not even to pull the trigger, but you just say like, just go ahead and aim at the target. How often you'll see people bring the gun up and they'll be like, oh, hold on. And then they have to drop the entire gun down because the sight profile from the top of the hand to where it's completely different. And their body will index to where a Glock sight should be. And they're like, oh, wait, hold on. You know, Um, it's just interesting now how that that can really affect you. It's something so small and you would never think about it until it happens. And you're like, whoa. Yep, that was significant. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually never been able to shoot a Glock for shit, and it's not for tr- not for lack of trying, you know. So I, it it used to be the only thing out there that had you know high capacity that you still could carry appendix and not have it print quite a bit. And I grew up shooting 1911s, and I remember my dad got one of the first Glocks. I mean, 
really early on. Like Glock is introduced, like he got one. He had he had quite the collection. Now, did he, he did was. he get one because he wanted it, or did he get it because he wanted to trash it, like prove that it was garbage? No, I mean there was nothing. Like it was it was just a new thing. Like let's let's try the new thing. Okay, you know? okay. So, in fact, he got two of them that were consecutive serial number. Oh, nice. <laughs> that is kind of. That's this kind of guy my dad is, and that's but, kind of that's kind of odd uh, for a 1911 fan to be able to be willing to be like, eh, I'll try something new because normally we know well, how 1911 I mean, guys have, are. He's not. I just grew up shooting them a lot, um, but you know we we just like firearms in general, right? So it's not like he <laughs> only has 1911s. It's got every, everything you can imagine. Um, but anyway, like the first time that I shot a Glock, I mean, God, the freaking man-sized torso target was probably only 10 feet away and i could not hit the damn thing <laughs> but i can i could shoot the freaking eye out of a gnat with a 1911 like i still can um and so for years i actually tried to get pretty good with the glock but for me it's just it's just not the the grip angle or whatever it is or i don't know what it is but i gave up now i shoot sig <laughs> for the other well there you go and you know i'll say this too like i i know uh, in reality, you know, most people say like, well, pulling a trigger is pulling a trigger and it shouldn't matter what gun you, you, you use. But the fact of the matter is e everyone's a little bit different and everyone's going to like a different feel, like something different, you know, whatever. So it's like, I, and to say like, well, the Glock is the cure all. I mean, Glock is just, it's universal for everyone could be like, uh, not really. Cause there are some people that just can't get used to the, like you said, like the grip angle or the trigger feel or anything like that. Like some yeah. people just shoot other platforms better than like, I can't stand um, XDMs and it's got nothing to do really with the triggers. It's just like my grip uh, won't allow me to disengage the grip safety on an XD from Springfield. It's a great gun. Yeah. I just can't shoot yeah. it, but you know what I mean? So it's yeah, just funny yeah. when, you, when you hear people like argue stuff like that. It's just like, man, why, why has it got to be one of the, I mean, that's, it can literally be, you shoot a Glock. Cool. You shoot a SIG. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and if you give me a Glock, like if I had to use it in a self defense situation, it's like no problem, obviously, but trying to shoot accurately, let's say 15 or 20 yards, like man, like I have to really, <laughs> I have to really think about it rather than just draw and shoot. Like I can most a 1911 or a 365 or anything like that. Like those, I can just shoot lights out mm -hmm. glock just gives me trouble well i mean yeah they're, they're not everyone's cup of tea for sure but now so obviously we talked about the fact that you now build rifles and all that kind of stuff um well actually you know worst that rifle i built for your girlfriend um was years ago now like typically i only build a rifle for friends and family mm -hmm. you know and, well and I, i'm sorry I, I misphrased that so obviously you manufacture lowers uppers like all sorts of gun parts yeah and all that kind we're of we're generally stuff. a parts business right yeah. right um but you weren't always into firearms as far as your career goes is that correct well i mean i've been i've yeah i mean i have kind of a a long history which brought me to making firearms i mean i can <laughs> I mean, like my first, my first entrepreneurial thing was fourth grade. <laughs> like when I, when I was in fourth grade, when I was in fourth grade, like my friend had a paper route and like, I don't see kids having paper routes anymore. But at the time, like when you got out of school, it was real common to have a job delivering the paper, which came at four 30 in the afternoon instead of being out on your driveway in the morning, you know? And, and so kids, that was a job kids could do. And uh, one day, my friend, who was the paper delivery boy, uh, he used to just deliver him on his bike. He just came crashing into our house, like, you know, before my parents were home from work. And he was like, you know, you got to come with me. <clears throat> and I knew, like, the urgency of his voice. Like, I, I needed to, like, he, this man had something. Like, it was not a time to ask questions. It was like a time to get on your bike and go see what was up. So we rode down this gravel road to this to this house where he had delivered a paper and it was like the day before the night before the trash was going to come out the next day for for our neighborhood and on top of this trash can at this guy's house was this big something wrapped in black plastic and it had a note on it that said i can't bear i i'm too old for these but i can't bear throw them away so what do you think was in that bag in this thing um i'm too old for these but i can't bear 
to throw them away. So we set them on top of the trash can, hoping that the the trash man would pick them up. It was a stack of Playboys. Oh. I mean, it was a stack of Playboys. <laughs> you know, I'm in fourth grade. And, you know, there's no internet if you're not in fourth grade. Like, things are different. You struck gold. We literally struck gold. <laughs> and we we brought those back to my place. And uh, I somehow squirreled them away from this guy. And I, I partnered up with another friend of mine who was a little bit entrepre- more entrepreneurial. And we would, like, we spent an afternoon, like, cutting out the centerfolds, like the half page, the smaller pictures. Like we went through so many of those magazines and then we would roll them up like a centerfold. We'd roll it up and put a little rubber band on it. And then I had taken like a cigar box that my dad had, just like an empty cigar box. And we just had them so neatly stacked and just like rolled up in there. And we went to our friends, you know, and, and we'd just be like, you know, you open up the cigar box and we sold like the centerfolds were like a buck. The half page was like 50 cents. The smaller stuff was like we had, you know, quarter 25 cent offerings in there. And that went really good for a long time but until some kid who happily had like built up a nice collection got caught and then just ratted us all out. And pretty soon our inventory dried up as the parents figured out what was going on. So I don't know. I've always been sort of interested in trying to figure out how to make how to make money. You know, I can remember thinking as a kid, like I, I so I was born in 1973, and around 1973 to 1980, somewhere in there, the Pet Rock came out. Mm. And as a kid, I can remember just thinking to myself, like, you know, this dude, some dude, is painting a face on a rock and putting it in a box. And convincing the world to buy a pet rock, you know, and that dude became a millionaire off of that. Like I, since the early days of my life, I have always tried to figure out like what I could do that, that I would be passionate about and, um, and make money off of, you know, so from all the ways, all those days back, it took me until I was in my late thirties to actually have an idea that, that sort of aligned with both uh, my passion, which has always been firearms and, uh, And then my capabilities to like get products uh, designed and launched and things like that. Yeah. You know, it's, you see some things like I, I, it always giggles me every time, like someone orders a drink that comes with a little umbrella and I'm just like, I wonder how many little umbrellas exist in the, in the world that every bar has a stock of. And what is the dude that invented that doing right now? Yeah. It's probably only one or two companies that do it, you know, and they're probably, they're probably producing millions of them. It's like the perfect business. Those things that are consumables like that. Yeah. I almost got into the idea of making ammunition because because it's a consumable, you know, it's like our version of, of like the firearm version of drinking coffee or something, you know, it's like you need more of it every day. When, when I started doing sales at, at Arms Corps and Rock Island Armory, that was like my, I was pushing so hard to sell guns that ammo was just like in my mind, for whatever reason, the gun was the part I wanted to sell. Uh, because mm-hmm. like I'm selling a $500 gun, you know, like I don't, $15 a box of ammo. Like what am I going to do with that? I want you, know, you buy the... And then the first time I got a, a big enough customer that was like, yeah, okay, here's a $50,000 ammo order. I was like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. And then, you know, in a couple months, here's another $50,000 order because again. I sold it all. Was when I was like, oh my, yes, the gun. Why am I focused on the gun? I need to be selling the ammo. I need to be selling the mags because you only you only sell one gun. But you need five yeah. magazines. You need five boxes of ammo for it. And that's where I, I started yep. figuring out like, oh, okay, yeah, you don't make the money on the... Yep. The hardware you make it on all the accessories kind of thing, but uh, that's yeah. a, that's an absolute fantastic story about your uh, your beginning entrepreneurship. <laughs> that's... that's the that's the first thing. That's the, literally the first story I can remember. We after that we after that inventory got taken. Uh, we used to steal chrome caps off of uh, cars. Like we had a hospital that was nearby, and we could ride our bikes down to the down to the hospital and sort of kind of go in and out of the of the uh, parking lot. And if, you know, look down and you see someone's got Chrome stem caps, like kids used to love those for their bikes, you know? So we would, we would, we would, we had quite the collection of those, but that's like pretty high risk business. And once you sell a kid, a set of Chrome caps, like 
he's got chrome caps now, you know. Yeah, like, he does. The Playboys, like, they would come back, you know, like, oh shit, this was that was a pretty good deal. I'll take another. I got another dollar. What else you got, <laughs> you know? But chrome caps is kind of a one time thing, and then, and then you know, another another situation where we got caught. And how did it feel when you got all them dollar bills? Being like, that's right. Anyone else want chocolate milk? I got. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I felt good because we were poor. Like my family, like I grew up fairly, fairly, you know, powdered milk, m- milk type poor. So I have been focused on not being like in that situation since I was quite young. I think, I think honestly, that's what was a big driver for me. You know, was oh, I, yeah. To I mean, feel that way. It's you know uh, what necessity is the mother of invention, and people think that that sometimes is just like a product, but in reality, that can also be motivation. If you ask me, like, yeah, the person that. <clears throat> maybe decides like, you know what? Dad was a drunk, used to beat the crap out of me. I refuse to be that person for my child. And they like, stop it right then and there. That's, that's kind of a mother of invention. It's, it's being able to, even for your family yeah. to, to say like, no more, the buck is going to stop right here. I'm changing this, uh, the, the direction of this family, you know? So, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's like just hearing your parents over and over, no matter what the topic is, say you know oh you know we can't afford it (laughs) like you can hear that you start hearing that so many times it's like it's gonna send you one way or another like you're either just gonna resign yourself to we can't afford it and we'll never be able to afford it or how how do do we afford it i think that's i think that really impacted me quite significantly as a kid yeah i mean like i said some people use it as an excuse and other people use it as an excuse to never let it happen you know so yeah yeah but um after i i my first like major job though i i was really fortunate to get a job at microsoft and it was uh wasn't my first but it was my first big job mm-hmm. and, and it was in their hardware group and which was also you know it was really great to get a job at microsoft at all and then to get one in the hardware group was really beneficial because at the time they were just making mice and keyboards when i got the job there and then went on to make xbox and all the surface products Xbox, Xbox accessories, and then Surface laptops and other Surface accessories. And that was a very small group inside Microsoft, a um, couple hundred people to start in the mouse keyboard Xbox days. And um, yeah, I got to see in working in that environment, I was a like what they called a supply chain operations manager. And so I, for a while, I was in charge of all of Microsoft's mouse production like the computer mice that you have sitting on your desk you know like we used to make a million of those a week mm-hmm. and it was like 13 or 14 40 foot high cubes just stacked with uh, uh computer mice every single week and so I, I worked a ton in the manufacturing side for microsoft i spent almost two years of my life in asia at various factories mouse keyboard xbox type factories so I got a really good feel for what good manufacturing, high volume manufacturing looks like. And then some years into my career at Microsoft, I switched over to the to work on the development side of the business. And um, right when webcams were like becoming a thing, before webcams were actually even integrated into laptops, they were, you know, it's little separate things that clipped on top. And, and they were expensive. I was in charge of Microsoft. Yeah, <laughs> I was in charge of Microsoft's entrance into the webcam space. Um, I was the project manager for that. So I spent uh, like fifth, over a 17 year period, you know, like 15 years at Microsoft. I had one one break in the middle where I went and started another business, but I spent about 15 years at Microsoft just in the hardware space, learning everything from um, manufacturing to product development. And at the end of the day, like no matter what product you're launching, they're all kind of the same thing. You know, they, the same marketing principles. You you got to figure out distribution and how you're who's going to carry your product. How are they going to sell it? How are other people going to make money on your product? And then you know what what good product development looks like. What good design looks like. Um, Microsoft really taught me all of that. And then the way that Sharpscribers got started was um, what. I was a technical diver. This is kind of a weird conversation, but I was doing some technical diving in in Seattle. This is where we lived. Uh, and Seattle has a couple big freshwater lakes. One of them is called Lake Washington. And on the shores of Lake Washington during the World War II time frame, there was the Sandpoint Naval Air Station. It's now a park. I 
can't remember the name of the park, but um, at the time during World War II, it was a training area, and in Lake Washington, there exists six or seven World War II aircraft still with machine guns mounted on them, bomb bay doors open, that kind of thing. Um, they are sitting on the in the bottom of the lake, and they're all you know in the 160 to 200 foot depth range. And the lake is fresh water, so they're not rusting, and it's really cold and it's dark. And uh, I got to uh, really wanting to explore those things. I was a diver already, but to dive in that range, you need to get onto like a helium oxygen type mixture. And so I went through a whole uh, technical dive training thing just so that I could explore these wrecks see the machine guns you could reach in there's a big pb4y2 that you can reach in and like grab the controls on and stuff i mean this oh, wow. amazing amazing aircraft are at the bottom of this lake okay so at the time uh this is probably around 2011 or so i had uh, two young boys and um and it was like one rainy saturday <clears throat> and i and we were just trying to figure out something to do when you have really young kids you know it's um, there's not a lot you can, can go out and do. So we decided, like I had just dove this wrecked course air and I said to my wife, I'm like, well, let's, let's go to the air and space museum, which they have in Seattle. And I'll show them what a course air looked like. It was just like something to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we went to the, to see this course air. And as we were walking in to see this course air, there's a, there was a P40 Warhawk inside the building. It was called, it said O'Reilly's daughter. I'm, I'm certainly still have it there. And it's got the flying tiger face painted on it. And it literally just hit me in that moment because at the time, like laser engraving was starting to, to come about. And, um, um, people were laser engraving different things onto receivers, but, um, no one was actually machining really any great detail into the receiver. And so uh, I just said to my wife at the time, I'm like, man, someone should, someone should machine that into a receiver, <laughs> you know, and not just laser it in, but, but machine it in. Yeah. Well, and you know what you're at, uh, man, if someone lasered it in, it just still wouldn't be the same. Like there's something about having the texture, the contour and all that kind of stuff that just adds so much more to the look of the rifle, um, that you guys were able to pull off. I mean, I, seriously with the first time I saw it, my, I think I literally think my jaw dropped open. Like that is freaking beautiful. Like, Oh my gosh, who, who came up with that as a genius kind of thing? Cause it was, I mean, it was stunning <laughs> for me when I saw it and I was just like, that is so badass. But again, you know, this is the point. Like I've been, like I said, I, when I started shooting competition, I've been broke ever since uh, I looked at that and I was just like, man, that is something I'll never be able to buy because I could, probably couldn't afford it, but that thing is cool. And you guys dr like nailed it out of the park. And now that the Cerakote job, I mean, I I've got a gun here actually, <clears throat> This was done by a company called uh, Pinstriping by Rat, and and this is a, a prototype open gun yeah, that nice. I built, and it's got Boba Fett. Like I, I actually told him I was like, look, I'm a Star Wars fan. If you could do it like a Boba Fett theme, that'd be awesome. So I left yeah. it open to them, and instead they decided to go with Boba Fett's visor and the color scheme and stuff. And when it came back yeah. again, my jaw dropped because I was like, you did this with Serico? Like you do? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a gun, right? Out there. Yeah, and I'm like, it's a gun. Yeah, it's going to get beat to hell. Like, and you're putting that much time and effort into it. But man, that, since then, I've obviously learned my lesson because that thing is actually able to take a beating and still look as pretty as it does. But your guys' rifles, Yeah, man. that's kind of the beauty of Serico, right? Yeah, yeah. It can, it can take a beating. And now these people are getting so good at how to, I mean, I've watched some people do the Seracoding jobs now where they just, get, they're getting, you know, I see paint and I'm like, okay, give me the brush. Here's the wall, yeah. right? And for someone to be <laughs> yeah, like, I'm all right, well. I'm going to, I'm going to do black first and then I'll do white and then I'm going to take a piece of newspaper and smack my hand on it and let it go. And whatever flakes off is going to be, you know, the handprint and stuff. I'm like, I never would have thought of that. I'm not even going to lie. Never yeah. in a million years. You yeah. could have sat me there with a, a thing of newspaper right in front of a wet wall. And at no point would I have been like, yeah, that's a good idea. I would have read the newspaper yeah. and just watched paint dry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now when you're, we you're, launched Hellbreaker. It was one of those things where, I mean, it was, people were very love it or hate it. I mean, they really still are. And actually, uh, I don't many people know this, but, you know, we have, we've expanded quite a bit beyond the face design receivers. So we have a, a bolt action category. We're just getting into grip modules for the P365. 
Uh, we got a blade line. We got a number of a number of other categories out there. But the face design collection. It took us ten years to come up with the fa the five designs, and that collection is now complete. Like we're not working on further face designs. I consider like the I consider that that monument to to be finished. So we've got Hellbreaker, Warthog, the Jack, Overthrow, and Showdown. So th those are those. That's the package now. Why? Well, I mean, it's, oh, it's still an awesome collection, is, though. Oh yeah, thank you. What I started to say is when we launched that Hellbreaker, it was very, very love it or hated. And I guess I did say like people are still that way. And, you know, early on, you know, years ago, um, it does, I, it, you, you get kind of hardened to the, uh, to the love and the hate, I guess. Um, I used to be in one of those places where I could hear 10 compliments about it and, and maybe one negative thing. And you start over indexing of like, oh, maybe this thing is shit, you know, but over time, what I realize is like, man, even it, passion for or against really, really is a, an excellent marketing tool. Oh, yeah. It's an excellent marketing tool because we would see people that were, I mean, I was having people take time out of their day to like figure out what my email was and like uh, email me just to trash me and say, you know, what a piece of shit that I must be, you know, for launching something like this. <laughs> it's just like crazy stuff, you know, the internet's horrible, but um, what I quickly found was, is that, you know, those people would be like sharing, sharing it with their friends. Like, can you believe this shit? And like freaking at least 50% would be like, man, that's actually, I don't know. I think that's pretty cool. And so the, 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 certainly the people that liked it help, help spread the word that, you know, it was a new thing in the marketplace, but even the people that hated it really helped spread its viral nature of like, no, this is something that's really different. No one else no one else is doing anything like that. Even to this day, no one is doing anything like it. And, uh, and yeah, helped, help drive us sales. And now we've, I mean, we've sold tens of thousands of face design type lower receivers since that time. And I can remember, honestly, like the first 500 that I sold to Spikes Tactical, cause it was before, like, I couldn't get any of the big distributors to even call me back. And so for a while it was like, we would ship to spikes and spikes would then just put in their boxes and, and send out to the, to distribution until the distributors would start dealing with us directly. But, um, um, I remember when I sold the first 500 to those guys, I said to my wife afterwards, I'm like, well, no matter what, like those 500 are going to last forever. <laughs> like I have, I have at least made a dent in the firearm space. Like those 500 units, I have no idea where they are now, but I remember thinking like, you know, those, these are not just going to get, you don't, it's machined out of a block of aluminum unless someone purposely destroys it, it's not going to get destroyed. And so now we have at least 500, 500 firearm receivers out into the wild. Like no one can ever take that back. Yeah, no, <laughs> it felt good. You know? Absolutely. And you know what? I agree with you entirely about the whole thing. Like, you know, <clears throat> it's so easy to focus on the one bad comment, the one negative comment that someone leaves or whatever, even though there there could be 10 great ones and to see the one negative and you're yeah. just like clearly you don't know what you're talking about so let me educate you and, and i learned pretty quickly to be like man when you're on online especially like millions of people have that as a platform and if one yeah. percent of a million people are upset with you you're going to be replying to messages all day long and ignoring the other 99 percent still oh, silly yeah. to be wasting your yeah, time actually <laughs> That's kind of funny. Like that's, it's just statistics, right? I, I have the same theory about like serial killers and stuff like that. Like why you need to be ready all the time, but backing up, like I wish if I could have people take away one lesson, it's like you, if you're coming out with something new, like if you're passionate about it or you're, you think it's great, like just keep driving on it. Like mm -hmm. I, you get hardened to it really fast. If they're not hardened to it, to the negative sort of comments, like you'll get, you'll find that Hopefully you'll find that you get hardened to it pretty fast. And, and if you don't, you know, you need to work on how to harden yourself for it. Cause you know, most people that are going to, are going to give you a negative comment like that are, are not doing anything unique themselves. You know, it's like you, you're not hearing from peers. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know what, it, it's also funny to me too. It's like for someone to take time out of their day, to type out a message or type out an email or search you out and all that kind of stuff just to shit talk you. You're kind of like, boy, you sure got a lot of free time to, to trash on me. Like, are you happy? 
Because unless you're yeah, perfectly yeah. happy with who you are as a person and where you are as a person, like maybe you ought to focus on yourself and, and less on me. Because you, you just spent an hour trying to find me so you could trash me when you could have been spending that hour going to the gym or reading a book or, you know, doing something productive. And instead, yeah, yeah. you chose you know, all these flavors of life and you chose to be salty. <laughs> So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that your statistic thing. What I, to finish my thought on that is like what I've said to um, other people about why you know you should be you should really daily carry is that you know I don't even know how many people are in the United States. Is it something like 180 million or something like that? Maybe it's I, more. Than that. I'm shy. Yeah, I have no clue, but I'm sure yeah. it's ridiculous. But if it, if it's, I mean, even if it's, even if it's no matter what the number is, like you take 1% of that, let's say it's freaking 3000 people. If one, if 1% 1 of a given population of 300,000 or 300 million type population is, is, has tendencies, tendencies towards being a psychopath or something. Okay. Well, that's 3000 people and there's 50 States like divide 3000 by 50. That's how many people are walking <laughs> around your state fucking psycho <laughs> yep. and ready to do some serious damage if you're not ready to defend um it's like it's just statistics and it's like it's just statistics they're out there they're in your neighborhood maybe not your neighborhood but they're they're in your uh, general vicinity yeah and you know what the other thing that i noticed <clears throat> you know so I, I did ems in vegas for eight years and now, now that I've been in, after being in that environment, I can see how quickly things can deteriorate from a human nature perspective of like someone could be cool, calm, collective. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're swinging at you. They were not yeah. doing anything to say, like to give off the signal. Like, it's not like they were like in my face, screaming and yelling, puffing up and stuff. They were playing nice to get my guard down. So then they, when they swung, you know, and that's not like a normal human, like if you're pissed off at someone and you're going to swing at them, you're like almost letting them know, like, dude, I'm, I'm, you're getting on my nerve kind of thing. Right. Yeah. That's a pretty big manipulation tactic that they were taking there. Right. Yeah. And, and the fact that like the first time that ever happened to me, I was completely unaware uh, or un unprepared for that kind of an interaction. Whereas my FTO made it a point like, look, he's like, you got to be careful with every patient. It doesn't matter how nice they're being or whatever, like just be ready. Cause we're dealing with mentally unhealthy people and physically unhealthy people. You know, like it was, yeah. it was the most interesting fact that like I got in probably more fights as an EMT than I did when I was training to become a black belt in Taekwondo. <laughs> like <laughs> I'm in the dojo. Yeah, My I mean, you're you're in a role where you're trying to help people and it's like more fights. Yeah. And it's not even, it's not even about like anger or hate. Like sometimes it's someone's having a diabetic emergency, their blood sugars dropped low. They become confused. It doesn't matter that you're wearing a uniform and a badge and you show up in a big shiny truck with lights on it. Dude, in their mind, you're someone just there to hurt them or whatever. So they're fighting you because they're confused. Like they're legit having a yeah. medical issue. You can't go swinging on him out of hate being like, mother, you know, I'm going to knock you. It's like, dude, yeah. give him some sugar. And I, I guarantee you in like 10 minutes, he's going to be like, whoa, what happened? And then you can explain to him how he was being an a-hole. But, <laughs> you know, like, so it was yeah. just very interesting to Vegas see. Is a, Vegas is extra special for, I mean, you. I, I lived in Henderson for a year or a year or two. And yeah, it's like that you're also in an area there where if things go bad, you, man, you're like one day away from total fucking chaos in, yeah. in Las Vegas. Absolutely. Because so much is being trucked in. Um, everything, everyone is dependent on the air conditioning. Your wa every, your waters, all your food, all that stuff is just being trucked into what otherwise is a barren landscape around you. You know, and it's like if something turns that off, trucks can't come in. AC is not working or whatever. Like you're hours, you're hours in Vegas away from total fucking chaos. Yeah. If the water shuts off, it's done. It just yeah, the water. Yeah. If just the water fails, it's done. City's dead. Yeah. You can't do anything. You can't yeah. flush your toilets. You can't, you know, so. And people are going to get fucking <laughs> real weird right away. Yeah, exactly. Right that's away. where, that's where the, that human nature will pop out. Right. So it's, it's interesting though. Yeah. As we were talking about that, that mindset of being prepared, like a lot of people think be prepared means go to the range, train, be proficient in your firearms. No, sometimes be prepared means, Hey, when you're walking your car, stick your phone in your pocket and have your head on a swivel. 
and and you know yeah. keep like that that right there could probably stop a lot of interactions that are on the negative side from people just by that's a pretty big deterrent if if you if someone's trying to approach you and then you turn and you look them square in the eye and you're like I acknowledge you I see you man that person yeah. might go from hey I'm going to rob this person to just coming up and be like hey, man, can I have a smoke like it could change real quick yeah. like okay this guy's a little too squared away from me I want someone that's oh what's what what Donald Trump say on on true social now you know whatever <laughs> but um yeah. Yeah, but it was it was it was a unreal wake up call for me when I the first time I had that kind of interaction where someone just completely went from zero to a hundred in the blink of an eye and I was still stuck at zero wondering like, is this real life? Is this really going on? Like I spent so much time wondering yeah. if it was going on that I didn't react to it. My FTO had to interact, you know, and, and block it off from happening. But I was just like, Whoa, that I was not expecting that. Like when you say be prepared, we mean for anything. Like, yeah, those psychos are out yeah. there and they'll just come out. I mean, what was that? Do you ever see those videos of the guy that was like, I can't remember what they called him. They called him like the Tesla attacker or something like that. A te Tesla assailant. Like, This guy would just drive around in his Tesla, randomly stop in front of people, get out with like a baseball bat and start beating the hell out of their car. You're like, yeah, those are the kind of yeah. people that are out there. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it's just statistics. They're everywhere. <laughs> yep, yep. You're not going to always see them, but they're there. Yeah. So you said you were a black belt in what was it, Taekwondo? Yeah, yeah, third degree. So that uh, Taekwondo is a lot of takedowns, I guess. Yeah, I mean, obviously good kicks and things, but there it's sort of you got a little bit of a judo mix in there. With uh, no, takedowns. not really. Taekwondo is really based on like kind of the self defense side of it, and and mostly kicks and punches, a few a few kind of holds, but not not really like anything to like. Okay, let me let me throw you on the ground, and now I'm going to roll with you. It's really more yeah. so about the yeah. I was going to say it's like almost like. I mean, you should maybe think about getting into jujitsu, you know, for if you're an EMT still, <laughs> because it's like, okay, you've got a dude that is attacking you. You know, you can't throw a freaking roundhouse to his head uh, or a round kick to his head, but you know, you can control that person. Um, jits is really, I think jits is really good for that. You know, and, and oh gosh, I mean, between MMA first making its big old blow up, right? Like I, it was funny. We were talking about, um, MMA fighting and, and the UFC and stuff. And I brought up with, with Kelly, I was discussing with her. I go, you know what? The first time I ever saw UFC, I remember I found a VHS tape of UFC one when it was like, and in this corner fighting in the style of wrestling is but yeah. and in this corner fighting in the style of Kung Fu. And it was literally two different martial arts going against yeah, each it was other. Awesome. Right? Yeah, it was awesome. And it was, and do you remember that it was also a, a tournament style? So it wasn't like, and the main event for tonight is it was, here's eight fighters. These two would fight, these two would fight. Whoever won those had to go against the winners of those two fight. And then yeah. they had to fight one more. In one night, you get the winner would have to go through three rounds or three fights with three individuals yeah. in order to be crowned the UFC champion. And it was just like, bro. Yeah, gosh, is... I should get that back. I should I should watch that again. It, that, those it was were gold, cool. Those are some golden days. And remember, remember, Hoist Gracie used to rock people. It was like. Yeah, try and throw the, all the punches you want. But the second I get you on the ground, I'm going to wrap you up like a pretzel and have you crying home to mama. And that's what he did. And, and so, you know, jujitsu. And that's though, how jujitsu got to be so popular, for sure. Exactly. There was actually a, a Gracie brother in Vegas that had a dojo studio um, in Vegas up on uh, when I when I went in there to to ask him about lessons and stuff was like up uh, kind of kind of just south of Summer Summerlin. He had a uh, jiu-jitsu studio there, but um no, I've 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 considered it. I've looked into it, but like, you know, now I'm in Chillicothe, Missouri. I don't see many ju great jiu-jitsu masters coming out of the home of sliced bread right now, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is I'm definitely a, something I think would be good. Belt in, I'm a purple belt in 10th planet jiu-jitsu and there those there's a lot of 10th planet like that's the no gi style of jiu-jitsu and there's a bunch of those that are popping up um uh, I bet you might be able to find one pretty close to you. Maybe I, I ought to look into it because I do think it would be something good. And then, like, I'm always also too like, there there was a time where you know my weight my weight got to a point where I was like, I'm pretty unhappy with this. Like, I looked in the mirror and I was just like, wow, I almost need a second mirror now. Um, <clears throat> so I got into hockey. I started I started I bought ice skates. I bought hockey gear. I started going to stick and pucks and just burning calories left and right. You doing that? Um, and now here, there's not a big hockey scene. Like the closest ice rink is a little over an hour away. So yeah, and not that it's a bad drive. I could do it, but yeah. How I mean, how old are you now? Uh, how old am I now? Thirty seven. 
37. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, you got, it's, you're in, you're in the, one of those inflection points, right? Where you got to figure out like how to keep the cardio going. Yeah. Um, or, or, you know, you, you will start packing on the pounds. You look fine to me right now though. Very oh, handsome. Thanks. <laughs> That's so sweet of you to say. <laughs> it's cause I'm wearing a vest. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not very form fit. It's very slimming. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's, that's what I go for. I, uh, no, no. I, and, and it's funny too, working out kind of like I'll get, I'll get really good into a workout routine and what ruins it is deer season. Cause as soon as deer season yeah. comes around, like I can't work up a sweat and then go out and sit in a tree stand being all sweaty. Cause I'm just going to start giving off scent and stuff. So it's almost like deer season comes around. I stop working out. Um, you know, because I assume walking in and out of the property with all my gear and stuff like that and getting set up. I mean, it yeah. does get the heart rate up a little bit, but then you sit for four hours. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, what are, you're hunting whitetail out there from a tree stand and are you archery or deer or rifle? Yeah, no. So when, when I first moved out here, um, my goal, I never hunted a day in my life. So my goal was to take a buck for my first deer and it had to be with a bow. I refused to use a firearm because I was like, a eh, competition shooter going out there to kill a deer. Like, that's like, yeah. that's super unfair. At least with the bow, I've only been shooting it for about a year. Um, you know, makes it a little bit more of an even playing field of actually getting it off. But, and I got, I got so lucky with my first white tailed deer. I mean, I, so when, when I, when I first went out, I was told by the owners of the property that we hunt, he was like, okay, we got a tree stand here. We got a tripod stand here, you know, so just, Get out there in the morning before the sun comes up, get settled, stay quiet, and something will come around. And then if it's legal, you shoot it, right? And yeah. <clears throat> so this deer comes in. I, I Something I learned really quick, too, was the fact that, like, a 200-pound deer can sound like a squirrel, but a squirrel sounds like a 200-pound overweight woman hauling all of her Walmart groceries out of her car. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, there. so this guy just snuck up. I mean, by the time I recognized he was within shooting range, he was uh, 14 yards from me was when he was 14 yards from me. Right. Yeah. So he walks out. I'm like, I'm like, oh, my gosh. OK, cool. Like, I'm, I, and I even got it on camera. Uh, I turn all my cameras on. I get my bow. He steps out. I draw back. He goes broadside and just kind of quarters away a little bit. And I send the arrow. Here's how I got lucky is. When the arrow hit him, he ran off like 40 yards and then dropped. So I was like, okay, cool. Like longer heart shot. Like it, that was a pretty interesting, you know, like I got to drop, I got to watch this deer drop and die. Yeah. Yeah. I went back and watched the video on my phone and I was like, I don't get why he dropped and died. Cause that arrow was pretty far back. Like that should have been a gut shot for sure. So yeah. when I finally went down to the deer, uh, what we found was that, on his back hind leg, right on the bone, there was a cut from where my broadhead hit his bone, turned and deflected, missing all of his guts, going right underneath his rib cage and getting him in the heart. Oh man, yeah, you did. <laughs> so I, I, I can tell you right now, I could try and take that shot a hundred times, and I'll miss it a hundred times, like you know. It yeah, was unreal yeah. that happened, but that was my first, uh, that was my first deer that I ever took. With, what, with uh, what, I'm curious what kind of bow you got for your first one. Uh, so the first official bow I ever had was a bear claw. And that was like when I was, you know, 12 or 13 or something like that. And my dad bought it for me. Um, <clears throat> and then this bow that I actually went hunting with, I, I bought it about, um, you know, like I said, a year before we had moved out here to Missouri was a prime logic. So it's yeah. it's that one weird one that's got the two cams on the top and two cams on the bottom. They do like they call it a parallel cam system. Yeah, I've um, never shot that one. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, you know, I tr I tried a couple when I was when I was getting ready to tr potentially buy a new one. Um, I tried a Matthews, I tried a Hoyt, and I tried an Elite, and then I tried a Prime. And for whatever yeah. reason, I just found myself going back to the Prime. And you know, that goes back to saying, you know, what we talked about. Like sometimes Matthews is a great bow. Hoyt is obviously a great bow, and all. But for whatever reason, I liked the way the, the prime felt. I liked the draw. I liked the way it had the limb stops and stuff. Like it was just the bow yeah. for me. And yet other people pick up my prime and they and they'll try and shoot it and they're like, Ooh, I don't like that. I'll I'll go back to my Matthews. It's like, cool. That's I didn't tell you you had to buy yeah. a prime, you know? Yeah. I do I shoot both. Like we um I mean I I rifle hunt typically like with hogs, we like to take rifles for those. Um deer this year I killed a deer with a bow. 
Um, and that's probably my sixth deer with a bow, I guess. Um, I started bow hunting around the time I started uh, sharps rows, I guess. Um, we have in the town that I live in is the um, the factory for Bowtech, so we're all Bowtech fans here. Nice, okay. And they make great um, bows; they really do. Oh yeah, they're fantastic bows. I mean, they're. I think the technology has sort of come together where it's a little bit like an AR. It's kind of hard to tell the difference between the different manufacturers. Like, which one do you like? Yeah, great. Then go with that one. You know, mm. same, same with. I think between the difference between say Bow Bowtech and in my mind Bowtech and and Hoyt are kind of like up in the in the very top end. But mm. I say that being biased as a Bowtech guy. But I, I, I really, really like archery hunting. I mean, there's something about just drawing that bow back with your own power um, and sending an arrow like you're talking about and in, in like basically total silence, you know. Mm -hmm. And actually, I do some some spot and stock and some tree stand stuff for blacktails here. We'll, my son and I will do – one of my sons and I will tree stand for, for blacktails and – and there's just something about like um, skidding into that stand and and have being scent free and being motion motionless and camouflage and kind of finding that it takes thirty or forty minutes for the birds to start you know chirping again and the squirrels to start moving again and like just blending in with what you know, at least here man like the woods are just insanely quiet insanely quiet so yeah like deer can you really got to be on it to see them coming in because even when they're trotting they're quite quite quiet and in our area we have a ton of fir trees the squirrels will get up in the trees and they'll kick little branches and stuff out and so that's what you'll hear hit the ground and you just for for sure think it's a deer that's like made a mistake and like broken a twig or something and it'll turn out to be a squirrel you know but yeah, you know what? Now yeah, I think I about really, it, I really like our team. Every deer that I've killed so far has been a "holy shit, he's here" moment. Because the yeah, the one I killed last year, um, I had two squirrels fighting behind me for an hour, and then I kind of heard it on the other side of the tree, and so I just stood up to like stretch because I'd been sitting there for maybe like an hour and a half. I stood up to stretch yeah. and I turned over to my right shoulder, and sure enough there's one of the eight point bucks that I was on my kill list. And I was just like, Oh my God. Like, and he had, he, he happened to have his head turned away from me when I just, I mean, I'm talking straight up, just like I got up and stretched like no, no big deal. I, there was nothing subtle yeah. about it. And I got so lucky that his head was completely <laughs> turned the other direction. And he was like licking his body or something like that. And I was just like, yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. And, and then the one this year I was sitting in my tree stand and like, I just, didn't hear anything. I was just doing my scan after, you know, sitting there staring forward and watching, watching, watching. I just went to go do my scan and I turned back and sure enough, here he comes. Like I, I nicknamed him Ricky Bobby cause he was not stopping for anything. Like he was just, he was just on a mission. He was just walking through the, the yeah, woods. He was probably in the rut or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, was right on. before the rut was starting, but it was like getting yeah. fired up. And so he was just on a yeah. mission. Um, I was barely able to get him stopped. And, and I'll say this too, you know, when, the first time I went out and shot, um, I had a little camera with me, but like the the video footage is gone. You know, I posted it on a MySpace years ago, which I don't know if you know this. MySpace doesn't really exist anymore, right? So I don't have that video yeah. anymore. But like, if I would have known how significant that day would have changed my life, I would have hired a film crew to document it for me, right? And yeah, yeah. And so when it came to hunting for me, I decided I was like, you know what? I'm gonna film these. Like, I'm gonna try it. I don't know if it's gonna be good or not, but at least I'll have a memory of like, this was my first deer hunt. This is my first time I ever tried to kill a squirrel or you know whatever. Yeah. And I found out real quickly that deer hunting is hard, and I made it so much harder by trying to film it because now I have to keep oh, control yeah. of batteries and where's the camera pointed and no, I can't shoot him now because he moved out of frame and now I got to draw down and move the camera. And oh draw yeah, very difficult. So much more involved in this. This last guy, my my phone wasn't agreeing. I got an Apple Watch for the for the reason that I use my phone for a lot of filming and I can turn my camera on using my Apple Watch. So instead of having to reach up to turn the phone on, I can just tap tap and get oh, my yeah. get my camera filming. So would you just put it on your phone on wide angle or something so you can make sure you capture as much as you can? Yeah, I've got a fisheye lens that I clip onto it. Yeah, so it can oh, okay. open it up a little bit. And then, um, but that that morning, I couldn't, my watch wasn't connecting to the phone for whatever reason. And I sat there. So I had this whole like 
50 yard open area that I was planning on using to shoot the deer in. And I couldn't get the phone up and running. And I spent so much time wasted that by the time I was like, you know what? Screw it. I've got, I've got this camera pointed. Not sure where it is. I've got my GoPro going. I'll just see, do what I can. Um, he had walked through that 50 yard area. And now I got to a point where there's trees in the way there's limbs in the way. And I literally had like a one foot by two foot window that, he, that I was able to stop him in to try and send this arrow through. And it, it ended up being a, a 20, I think it was a 26 yard shot through this window and ended up double lunger with a heart uh, kill for him. So it was, it was awesome. I didn't get to see him crash cause he took off like a bolt of lightning. And of course he had to go down the hill, right? Like he was like, ah, if I'm going to yeah. die, I'm going to make you drag my ass all the way up this hill. <laughs> Typically we think of it as like a good sign. If you see them, especially if they have a choice to make to go up or down and they're choosing down, you know, it's like you, you, you they're hurting. Yeah. And yeah, so the, yeah, the, last, the one last year went, went down the, down the property too, but, um, man, it, no, it was just that, like you said, and, and I found even when our, my cameras were dead and I wasn't getting a lot of pictures or videos of any deer coming in, I still went out there every morning when I could. And I remember one, one day Kelly texted me and she was like, why are you out there? There's nothing on camera. And I was, I had to explain to her, I was like, you know, for 34 years I lived in Vegas I didn't hunt. I didn't do anything. Like I woke up in my bed in my house and just kind of did my thing, my big city boy thing and all that kind of stuff. Dude, to, to get out there and like you said, like the act of, yeah, your stand might only be 200 yards away, but it takes you 30 minutes to get there because you are taking every step super deliberate and trying to be super quiet. And and if you hear yeah. something, you stop and you just chill and, and make sure like, okay, that just spook something or, you know, whatever. And And then once you get up in that stand – you just start hearing everything wake up and move around and you watch the sun come up and like start getting comfortable with you in the stand. Yeah. They accept that you're there. I, I, I've thought about that a lot. Like even when we're being quiet, walking through the woods, I mean, there are times where it's like you just driving through the woods and like stopping your vehicle and shutting the door. It's, 10 or 20 times louder than anything out in the woods that those, and I mean, they, they heard it. Trust me. They heard it. Yep. And even you walking through the woods, trying to be quiet, especially around here, we have pretty steep terrain and, and thick, thick woods. Um, you're just, you're, it's impossible for you to be the kind of quiet that it takes sometimes, you know? And if, yeah. if you are going to be that quiet, it's like better hope it's raining that always helps here for us, like heavy rain. Um, or you're walking so slow that every time you're taking a step, you kind of recognize that the picture has changed. Like there's new avenues to see and, and new frames to, to glass and see if there's a horn or a face looking back at you, you know, cause most of the time they'll, they'll stay pretty tight with our deer hunting. We make deer is the one where we have multiple cameras out on a 500 acre parcel and, we are, we follow those deer year round. Like we move the cameras around to understand their patterns. Like we're, we're way into it. And I, it's one of my favorite things because I have one, my youngest son, he will hunt the first season archery. Then uh, my older son will rifle hunt. And then I'll, I'll usually hunt the second season archery. And so we get like a three month period where uh, we can be out in the woods and uh, really, really like that. So we have multiple cameras out. We do this kind of the same thing. It's like by the time we're shooting, like we've pretty mu much named pretty much every good buck has a name that we've come up with for it. This buck I killed this year, um, I'm uh, positive it's going to make Pope and Young for just period. It's going to make Pope and Young, not like really high up or anything, but um, it's going to be one of the better bucks taken in Oregon this year. It's like we actually, for all the camera work that we have, we do on this property, had never seen this buck before. Just, it was peak rut and he was chasing a doe and I don't know how far he came. Uh, but in fact, he came right underneath our stand and it wasn't, I had told my son, like we have this buck that we call Angus and it wasn't Angus. And I, and he's like, God, are you going to shoot that one? And he came within like 10 yards of us, like right below us, just on the tail of this doe. And I'm like, it's not Angus, you know, <laughs> like it's not Angus. I'm not, I'm not shooting. And then he went by and, and he, he and I were able to talk a little bit more. And I'm like, you know, it's like I said, I had my target buck and, and I'm, 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 that's the buck I'm going to take. 
but we got such a great look at him when he came within 10 yards. Like he was just a perfect for in Oregon, a perfect blacktail is like a four by four that you can fit a basketball in mm. between the horns, like a four by four with eye guards. And that's what he was. And he was, he was really quite perfect in that regard. So I said to my son, I'm like, well, if he comes back around, you know, he's just out. He, he just had no idea that he walked right underneath us. I'm like, if he comes back around, I'll, I'll put an arrow in him. And, and I did. And he turned out to be, I'm positive. He was better than this, than the Angus buck that I was looking at from a scoring perspective. But Angus is still out there. So we'll be after him next year. Yeah, exactly. Right. So you, you still got your target buck to go for. But I mean, sometimes, you know, an opportunity passes by that you're just like, I, I've got to take it. Cause like, yeah, there's moments where you're like, oh, if you don't take it, you're like, I'm going to regret that later. I'm pretty certain yeah, I'm going to yeah. regret that later. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And especially with hunting too. I mean, it's just like sometimes like you said, especially during the rut too. Like I, I think I've gotten some of the best bucks ever on my cameras right before the rut goes. Uh, and then never seen him again. Like I'll go out and be like, all right, so it seemed like he was on this kind of schedule. So he should be coming around to the daylight morning time or whatever. So I'm going to make sure I hit it hard and, and hunt hard. Yeah. And you just never on any camera, you won't see him again. Like he just came through, cruised through and he's off and, on greener pastures and you're just like gosh like this the the appreciation that i have now for my meat that i harvest myself and butcher myself um man like it, it's it's a it's it's a different experience when you can pull something out of the freezer that has a story to it that you can relive in your head like when you pull the thing a backstrap out on a certain deer that you killed and you're just like Man, that was a fun hunt. You know, like I remember sneaking in that morning and how he came in yeah. and how I broke that shot and how quickly, you know, how where he died or whatever. And it's a it's a, a new level of appreciation for your food. And it's one that I've yeah. I've, I've grown very accustomed to liking that feeling. So uh I'm, yeah, I'm me super too. glad that I learned how to do it. We do a bunch of um not a bunch, but pretty much every year at least, we'll go and do uh we'll hog hunt. Um, and we hog hunt in Northern California. Uh, it's partly why I decided to decide or decided to design a bolt actions. Cause I was sick of like trying to figure out what AR I could take into California, you know, like I got to do what, like a mag, some button, bullet button. Or, like I'm not doing that shit. Yeah. No, <laughs> like, that's so, many... into bolt action, so I don't have to worry about this, but, um, uh, we eat a lot of pork. Like the California hogs are big. It's not like I've hunted them in Florida and in Florida, we were pretty much just taking the back straps out of them in Texas. You know, people are shooting them and leaving them, but in California, like these hogs are like my son this year shot one that was probably 240, 240 pounds. I killed one that was like 220 pounds, like very, very big hogs. And the meat is great. You know, ex excellent backstrap, excellent tenderloin. And then we have most, most of it turned into a, like a breakfast sausage. I swear, man, it tastes like the a sausage egg McMuffin. <laughs> it's like really good, which I consider very good taste. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, a lot of people do. A lot of... Yeah. A lot of people drink, eat, eat the sausage McMuffin for morning time. So yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we, we, we have a lot of venison, but also good amount of hog in the, in the freezer. I, I haven't had the pleasure of going hog hunting yet. Um, I'm actually in the process right now of, of uh, potentially building a, a well, not potentially, I've got the barrel and the receivers all set up here for a 300 blackout. Um, I, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with it, but I'll, all I knew is I was like, eh, if, I, if I build another AR, I just can't do a five, five, six. Like what, what's the point of having yeah. four of them around the house now? Like I, I want something different. Um, so I decided my to favorite, my out. favorite <laughs> AR caliber for hog and actually any midsize game is six, five Grendel. Like we certainly have killed like my, when my sons were younger, they both use a 300 blackout, but in an, in an AR caliber, like six, five Grendel, like it doesn't get the, the accolades. I think that it should, like, it should be a lot more popular of a round for the AR. Cause it is, it's hell on any midsize game. So we've taken everything from deer, hog, antelope coyote like all that kind of stuff it's 123 grain sst from hornady it's a phenomenal hunting round and then it's a great target shooting round too like we like to shoot long range steel and at a thousand yards the 123 grain sst is still supersonic you know it's still very it's very very stable 
ballistic co coefficient is really high. It's just a phenomenal AR-15 round, for, especially for killing or shooting shooting long range. It's an excellent, excellent round. Interesting. I, I, have, I haven't done much research on that round, but I'll have to, I'll have to look it up now because uh, that actually sounds pretty – yeah, 1,000 yards still supersonic is – it's pretty impressive yeah. for, an, for an AR platform. Like you look at an AR and most people don't think like, Oh yeah, I'd, I'd shoot something past 400 yards with that. And like, yeah. Yeah. I like the two, that six, five or two, six, four caliber, you know, you get those long lean bullets and they, they fly incredibly well. Yeah, I'll, so I'll have to look that up. My then. favorite AR caliber. Well, John, you know, if, we, we if, could sit here and chat all day long and we probably could no. even after I stopped the recording here. But uh, real quick, what, what I'd like to do uh, uh, and I'll give you a, a second here at the end, but uh, I've got a couple fast fire questions. These are just things that we, I just like to point out. It's just kind of a little bit fun okay. and different. Um, so we'll go from that and then we'll just kind of go from there. So, so the first question would be uh, a house salad or a Caesar? Oh, I usually just ah, fuck. I'd probably go Caesar. I guess I was gonna say house, but I do like a Caesar salad. I'm a ranch man, though. Generally, I'm a ranch person. I'll put fucking ranch on. It. I have ranch every single day. <laughs> Me too. I'm like uh, French fries. Where, where's the ranch? Pizza? Where's the ranch? Yeah. It's like, do you yeah. not put ranch I make on a anything? Wrap. Generally, I kind of eat in the. I try to be a little bit keto y in the way I eat, and so I make a uh, like a ham and turkey, cheese and ranch wrap. Like I have it almost every day. Uh, <laughs> Pretty Ke boring. Now. Kelly and I are on day three of, a, of the keto diet right now, trying to get back into. Like I say, we're all trying to lean up. You know, summertime's coming. Got to get that uh, that beach bod. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right you get kind of through the, the early phase of it too it's like i think you'll especially if you're getting back into taekwondo or anything else it's like it's really good for your cardio as well because mm -hmm. instead of burning uh whatever carbs you had that morning and that lasting like 20 minutes before you're going to crash your body gets used to burning the fat and that can last you, you, it lasts a lot longer but have you ever told an asian he can't have rice <laughs> just saying <laughs> I know you don't know. want to be in the same house as that guy. <laughs> All right, uh, iced or hot coffee? Uh, I just drink a hot dripped coffee. Nothing, nothing fancy. Perfect. Steakhouse, hot drip coffee. Steakhouse or steak at home? Uh, I if I'm going to go out to a restaurant, I'll go to like a sushi restaurant. I really like sushi a lot, but I don't get steaks at the restaurant because it all. I always compare it to my what I can do with my Green Mountain, and they're just not. I don't know. There's one, I can think of one steakhouse uh, that I used to go to in Seattle. It was called Daniel's Broiler. And it was at the top of this uh, Hyatt Hotel. It's in Bellevue, Washington. That was a fantastic steakhouse. I'm going to take my family again there sometime soon, but it's about my only exception where I'll order a steak at a restaurant. Mm. Unless we're like going to a specific steakhouse or something, you know, but yeah. if, if steak is not their specialty, I don't get steak. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, vacation in the mountains or on the beach? I like the beach. I spend a lot of time in the mountains already. And so, um, I, I mean, I'm in, I'm in up logging roads and in the woods, uh, year, pretty much year round. What my, my field office is for Sharps Bros is, is out in some timberland. And then we we spend three or four months, um, either in prep or during the hunting season for deer. So when we go for a vacation, I like to go to Hawaii. Oh yeah, well there's, on there's the beach. I've never been there, but uh I, I could see it for sure, the the mindset. So okay. Uh would you rather go back in time or would you rather go forward to the future? Hmm. Well, if I could go back in time with current information, like I would go back in time and then I'd be fucking a millionaire. <laughs> wouldn't we all, right? It wouldn't it wouldn't be called Google, it'd be called Sharp's Fast Internet Search. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, I'm not too hurt. I'm not too. I'm too much of a race for the future, man. Yeah, I know, right? Lord knows where the hell it's going to be right now. But uh, Wheel of Fortune or The Price Is Right? Uh, when I was a kid, we used to go over to my grandmother's house and watch Wheel of Fortune. So I used to like it, but I, I get a kick out of Price Is Right. I used to be really good at it as a kid because, like, you know, in the old in the quote unquote old days. Like we all kind of watch the same stuff, right? Like most people today probably don't watch Wheel of Fortune or The Price is Right. I don't. But when you're growing up, like if you happen to be around the TV at a certain time, like that was one of the, those were one of the shows that were going to be on, especially like a Saturday morning or something. So I used to be pretty good at judging Price is Right stuff. I think I, even as a kid, I think I could have won on Price is Right. So is your answer Price is Right then? 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I so, had too good with words. I know, right? Sometimes I'm like, place. I, there's a ton of those. What the hell kind of clue is that? That's so stupid. Yeah. This game is dumb. I would probably just totally embarrass myself on Wheel of Fortune, but I would kick some ass on Price is Right. The only time I feel smart watching Wheel of Fortune is when they have the kids on. And I'm like, oh, come on, it's green eggs and ham, you idiot. But like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, Kelly just recently found, so, you know, if you got like Pluto TV and all those like little free streaming services that are on your TV automatically now, she found a Price is Right channel that is the Bob Barker era. And it's like Bob Barker when he still wore, wore bell bottoms and stuff. Oh, yeah. Geez. And so we'll watch those every now and then. It's, it's so funny watching him get smart alecky with some of these these guests. Like they do something really dumb. And like instead of trying to play it off, he's like, well, that wasn't the smartest thing for you to do ever. Now, was it? It's like, oh, my <laughs> gosh, Bob, that is savage. So, yeah, I bet those are kind of fun, too, because nowadays it would be quite hard to guess some of those prices. Yeah. From Bell Bottom I mean, Day, Bob Barker. Yep. And you're sitting there and you're like, oh, it's, well, you know, here's um." you know, here's a brand new vanity or something like that. And you're sitting there going like, ah, yeah, it's probably about $800, $900. And they're like, oh yeah, what's your opening bid? 2,400, Bob. And you're like, 2,400, what the hell? Is it? And then it ends up being, it was a $33,000 antique because it was handmade and actually made with real wood, not made in China. And you're just like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Stuff actually used to last back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So... Right on. Well, John, at this point, I'd like to leave the floor open. If there's anything you'd like to say in the wrap up or, or anything like that, then the uh, floor is yours. So, oh, I, th- I think I'm good to go, man. It was, it was nice. It was nice chatting with you. So where will we find this uh, podcast it's streaming on all services? Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll be able to watch the video of it on YouTube and then uh, anyone else can stream it on Spotify, Apple or anywhere else that they can find any sort of podcast. So. All right, cool. Well, I'm looking forward to re-listening to it, I guess. See what kind of dumb shit that I said. (laughs) Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, again, man, thank you so much for coming on board. And uh, it was an actual pleasure to to chat with you. And I mean, we chatted a little bit at SHOT Show. Um, You know, I I was able to FaceTime so you could say hi to Kelly and stuff like that. And and again, you know, just looking at your rifles, it's just like, man, every time I, even to this day when I see them, and I'm just like... Man, those, those are some beautiful receivers. And then, like I said, I've I've shot the rifle that you built for Kelly, and I'm just like, God, that guy just knows what the hell he's doing, doesn't he? So he must be passionate about it <laughs> to get that good at it. So oh, I appreciate that, man. We have a really, really good manufacturing team, and yeah, we've gotten pretty good at we got a pretty good design eye, I think, for the in house for figuring out what uh, what's going to work. So where can people go to get more information about? the things that you make because it's not just receivers you, you make knives you make these chassis and stuff like even like the ruger 1022 you can you can trick out a ruger 1022 using your chassis and it'd be pretty badass so where can people get some information about that i know you, you have to get it through distribution so you probably have to go through a dealer but in order to like well, just I mean, shop, can, yeah i mean you can find everything at sharps bros so just sharps bros.com uh, sharps bros.com so we have yeah we have multiple categories so we have uh, the AR line, which most people know us for, the the crazy lowers, but we have a, a one we call Live Wire, which is a really kind of our quote unquote normal one. But it's one of my favorite receivers. Upper receivers, hand guards. We've got a beautiful AK receiver that's machined from a 15 pound block, a 4140 steel. Um, guys like Meridian Defense and Rifle Dynamics, Krebs Custom, guys like that have all built or are currently building rifles off of our chassis. Um, Meridian Defense is one of our, um, and Rifle Dynamics, they are probably our two biggest customers for the, for our, we call it the MB-47. Um, then I have this whole bolt action line uh, started because, like I was mentioning, you know, I didn't want to try and take ARs into California, and I like to shoot long range steel, so I knew it was a category we wanted to get into. And yeah, this year we have, we've got one for the Ruger short action, the Remington 700 short action, the Savage short action. And then we have one this year, we just launched at SHOT Show, a Ruger Ranch chassis, so it takes AR mags, um, which works with any of the ranch models from 223, 300 blackout, 762 by 39, um, all the way up to 450 Bushmaster. They all cycle flawlessly in, in our ranch chassis. Uh, we've got one that's coming out that's specific for the Ruger 450 Bushmaster that takes the, the three round 450 Bushmaster box mags from okay, Ruger, yeah. which a lot of people in the Midwest hunt with. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, we're launching a 1022 chassis. We're going to have, um, I've shown some pictures of that online. We've got one coming for the Ruger Precision Rimfire. And um, then we're going to work on a Ruger Long Action before the year's up as well. 
And then outside that, we also just launched um, a blade line where it's 100% machined uh, or 100% sourced and machined in the U.S., machined by our team. So we're, we're sourcing the MagnaCut steel. Um, it's a titanium frame lock design, things like 19 parts. So it's machined by the team. Um, but then I hand build and test all of them. I like back myself into like this full-time job of building these damn things. But they're a phenomenal, phenomenal knife. We've got three sizes. Um, this is the um, this is the two and three quarter inch size. I'm really really happy with these designs. Um, mag like I said, Magna Cut steel. Oh, I guess it's not on the camera. Magna Cut steel and uh, titanium frame lock, titanium clip. It's a really really nice design. We call this Mean Streak. Uh, so those are out this year. We got a two and a quarter inch, a two and three quarter, and a three and a half. Um, and then because I grew up shooting single shots, uh, we have uh, like the Thompson Center single shots and, and more recently some of the CVA single shots. We make a grip with rail interface for all the single shot platforms or those two major ones, Contender, G2 Contender, the Encore, and the CVA, CVA Scout, CVA Muzzle Loader. We've got a grip with rail interface for all of those single shot lines. So nice. yeah, that's it. We've, nice. we've, we've, the AR certainly pays a lot of bills, but we're <laughs> firearm and, and design enthusiasts here. So we're, we're going to touch every category we can. Nice. Yeah. I remember you posted the picture of the knives and, and Kelly instantaneous. was like, wow, if I'm going to cut myself with something, I hope it's with one of those. <laughs> yeah, they're, <laughs> they're pretty freaking amazing looking. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're nice knives. Very nice. Awesome. And the magnet if you're not familiar with the Magna Cut steel, it's a it's a new US made steel. It's it holds its hardness really well. We harden them to HRC sixty, sixty two. Um it's really corrosion resistant. I mean it's just a phenomenal stainless steel. So it's worth worth just checking out. Like it's kind of a new steel in the market and that's starting to get to be people are starting to realize how great of a steel it is. Probably the best stainless steel you're gonna find just in the world and it's a u.s made steel so it's really nice stuff nice well there you go ladies and gentlemen we're gonna we're gonna leave you on that little tidbit of information from from the great john sharps and uh, uh again i, I just i want to thank you for taking the time to, to pay attention listen to the podcast and hope you found it entertaining and um if you got any questions or anything like that hit up you know go go visit sharpsbros.com uh for any information for john and uh Again, I'm John McLean. Thanks for listening to Open Action, and I'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you.